Good morning, good afternoon, and or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And thank you so much for tuning in to this virtual side event during the 75th UN General Assembly meetings. It is my pleasure to welcome you to We Have Always Been Here, the power of feminist civil society in addressing compounded crisis. My name is Vivian Onano, and I'm a gender equality advocate, speaker, social entrepreneur, Women Deliver Young Lead Alumni and Women Deliver Board Member. Lots of titles. For the next 90 minutes, we'll engage in a critical dialogue about shifting power dynamics within the humanitarian system and hear from the women leading that important and increasingly multifaceted work. As you will hear, nearly all crises today are complex. They're not the result of just one of just a single armed conflict or natural disaster, but instead the compilation of multiple compounded crises. This has been clear during the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been a significant impact on girls, women, and other marginalized groups already affected by humanitarian crisis emergencies. For example, the recent explosion in Beirut, Lebanon, caused a significant loss of life, injuries, and widespread damage to critical infrastructure. The crisis is compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic and an ongoing political and economic crisis, all while the country hosts over 1 million Syrian and Palestinian refugees and vulnerable migrant workers. Similarly, uh, Bangladesh is simultaneously supporting more than 800,000 Rohingya refugees plus recording to natural plus responding to natural disasters and threats of climate change, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. To combat such compounded multi-level crises, a new approach centered on local feminist action is required, and it's required right now. While the international humanitarian system debates and discusses these needed shifts, women-focused civil society organizations have been steadily working to support girls, women, and other marginalized communities affected by compounded crises. They've always been there. And today, they join us to share their expertise and tell their stories. I'm really excited to hear their stories of the incredible work they're doing on the ground amidst many, many other obstacles. They are our real life heroes. We have an important and urgent discussion ahead. So let's get started. It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Diana Abu Abbas. Executive Director of Massa Sexual Health Center in Beirut, Lebanon. Diana is an activist for sexual and reproductive rights, LGBTQIA+, and women's rights, and a partner of Women Delivers Humanitarian Advocates Program. Diana, thank you for joining us today and for, and for the amazing work that you're doing on the ground. Thank you, Vivian, for your introduction. It's always a pleasure to participate in Women Delivers events. Thank you again for the opportunity and constant support. It has been quite a difficult year. Bangladesh has been heavily affected by COVID-19, several natural disasters, and the refugee crisis, while Lebanon has been crumbling under layers of economic collapse, political instability. COVID-19, it seems we haven't reached rock bottom yet. This disastrous year is impacting the most vulnerable. By that, I mean girls, women, and LGBTIQ individuals, and affecting their the access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. While preparedness is important, there's only so much one can be prepared for against such a multitude of crises. Now more than ever, and despite the increasing hardships of leading on the work we do, we need a feminist and localized approach to manage all the challenges we are facing. How do we do that? How do we tailor our approach to the needs of the most vulnerable? We need to coordinate, coordinate our efforts in managing our response. We need to engage women, and by women, I also mean trans women, in the design, planning, and implementation. We need to support the local organizations to be at the forefront of the response. And we have to remove the barriers and the questing accessing and dispersing emergency funds. And we need to have a fair and equitable distribution of those funds. Let's not forget that these disasters are happening now and they have been happening for a while. 
the victims cannot afford to wait for bureaucracy. When it comes to needs, we can make lists for days, but those are often treated as just words on paper. How can you expect refugee populations to observe hygiene as a COVID-19 precaution measure when the infrastructure for running water does not exist? How can you speak, how can we ask people to avoid HIV and unwanted pregnancies when the price of condoms has skyrocketed and access to pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV has stopped? I wonder if more Lebanese ministers were women, if they would have prioritized subsidizing men's shaving razors over menstrual products too. Today, vulnerable communities need fair and equitable distribution of aid among all those who need it. Protection measures for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence, where the law is the enforced, the abuser is removed from the household, shelters and legal support are made available, and survivors of sexual violence do not become social outcasts. They need a secure infrastructure to access food, water, hygiene, contraception products to prevent malnutrition, disease, and unwanted pregnancies. We need unconditional cash assistance to maintain the dignity of the affected and access to psychosocial support and information. In many contexts, LGBTIQ individuals have trouble accessing emergency aid because they are not considered families or widows or children or senior citizens. They are simply not considered, period. And yet these individuals have suffered a lot. They have lost housing, employment, and are still facing stigma. Large organizations and INGOs receiving the majority of the aid need to start applying a gender lens in their response. Sex workers have an especially hard time as their work has been heavily affected by the financial crisis and further depleted because of the pandemic. With a major loss of income, people are having to choose between eating and seeing a doctor or paying rent and buying contraception. We need to strategize and control the damage by setting the stage for local feminist organizations to step up and lead through their expertise and skills. Why feminist and why local? Because they work directly in the field and they understand the needs of girls, women, and LGBTIQ individuals. Most importantly, because they are trusted by their communities as their work and histories speak for themselves. These organizations carry the heavy burden of bridging the gap that should be covered by governments. And so they should be trusted to lead the work on sexual and reproductive health and rights in times of compounded crises. In the end, when systems fail us, all we have is each other and our feminist solidarity. And we get solace in seeing actions of solidarity, not just the words of support. That being said, I would like to thank all of our friends allies and partners in the region and in the international community for their actions of support during these more than difficult times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, for those incredibly powerful and inspiring words. And thanks too to Vivian for setting the scene for everyone today. And thanks most of all to all of you for joining us this morning or this evening or this afternoon. I know that there are a lot of demands on your time. This virtual UNGA is filled with lots of meetings and webinar fatigue is a real phenomenon. So I'm truly honored and privileged to have you all here with us today. My name is Marcy Hirsch. I'm the Senior Manager for Humanitarian Advocacy at Women Deliver. Women Deliver's humanitarian advocacy work guides partners at all levels of the humanitarian system, including international and local partners, to put gender equality at the center of humanitarian action. Through the Women Deliver Humanitarian Advocates Program, we provide direct support to five women-focused civil society organizations in Lebanon, strengthening their global advocacy uh, through technical meetings, international speaking opportunities like this one, and media engagement. As a result of this work, the humanitarian advocates are now highly skilled and sought out experts on the needs of girls and women and they provide much needed perspective to global audiences. You've just met Diana of Marsa and we'll soon have the pleasure of meeting the four other humanitarian advocates. We're going to be together for the next hour or so and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to join us. Let me describe our agenda and how this is going to work. We have two case studies coming up right away. One first on Lebanon 
and the other focused on Bangladesh. Both countries are managing highly complex emergencies that are, in fact, a compilation of multiple compounded crises. To combat such compounded crises, our current system of humanitarian response is straining to meet the needs. This means that a new approach is required that centers on local feminist action. We'll hear directly in the next few moments from feminist civil society organizations to hear how they are responding to these challenges and what support they require from the international, excuse me, the international community. After those two case studies, we'll be turning the floor over to two leading donors in the humanitarian action space to hear their reflections on the two case studies and the way that these efforts are supporting feminist civil society. We're then going to open the floor to hear from you for questions and answers. As questions arise for you during the course of the discussion, please go ahead and place your question into the chat or the Q&A function that you see at the bottom of your screen. My team will then make sure that those questions are read out to all of our panelists and responded to towards the end of our session. We're then going to wrap up our session with closing remarks that are going to further convince you, if you haven't yet been convinced, that a localized and feminist approach to humanitarian action is needed now more than ever. With that, I'm very eager to pass the mic on to the true experts of this event, the feminist civil society organizations that are leading solutions for crisis affected communities every day. First up, we're going to hear from the humanitarian advocates who are working in Lebanon. Cecilia Shami, the program's director for LFPADE, is going to get us started with some scene setting remarks. Cecilia, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marcy. Uh, and hello, everyone from Lebanon. Uh, I was asked to give like an overview on uh, Lebanon situation. So, uh, Lebanon one crisis or another for a long time. Uh, we had this, uh, Israeli aggressions and, uh, uh, and invasions. We have assassinations of political figures. And uh, in 2011, the civil uh, war in Syria affected Lebanon because like 1.5 million Syrian refugees uh, came uh, to Lebanon. Uh, so I'm Underlying all this uh, crisis, we have the sectarian system and corruption and uh, bad management uh, of the country. So if we uh, fast forward to 2019, in, uh, Oct on October 17 of 2019, uh, the people in Lebanon uh, decided to revolt against the political system. Uh, millions of people went to uh, uh, storm the streets. They were uh, demanding a new Lebanon, uh, modern, secular, and uh, responding to the people's needs and aspirations. Unfortunately, uh, the sectarian system uh, blocked uh, this uh, revolution, and uh, the people were punished by the collapse of the banking system uh, that prevented people from uh, accessing their uh, life savings. So people became worried about their money. Uh, the dollar to the Lebanese uh, money value became much higher. Uh, necessities became more expensive, salaries lost more than 30% of their value, and uh, really the Lebanese people felt uh, cornered and uh, hopeless. In February 2020, we had the first COVID-19 uh, case in Lebanon, and the government decided to put the country under a lockdown, uh, and this, of course, intensified the problems. People couldn't work, especially those that uh, depended on daily jobs to be paid. Prices rocketed uh, higher and higher, and the government uh, was incapable of finding immediate solutions to ease the suffering of the people. So we, uh, the country was already staggering, staggering under many problems, but it was pushed really over the edge on August 4, uh, at 6.07 minutes in the afternoon when uh, I, uh, an explosion of 2,750 tons of volatile chemicals exploded at Beirut airport. The explosion have had a major and devastating impact not only on Beirut, but also the whole of, of Lebanon. Uh, 200 people were killed, more than 5,000 were injured, hospitals were uh, destroyed and uh, were out of service when most needed. 300,000 people found themselves on the streets with no 
shelter, business, businesses closed, people were out of jobs. So everyone was hit really very badly. Two months after this explosion, the Lebanese are still in shock and they are trying to put the pieces together. Uh, on top of all this, we now have a political uh, showdown and the country is at, as a, at a standstill. The Lebanese people, are, uh, or most of them, are looking for ways to really leave this sinking ship. The only uh, hope in this bleak situation is the civil society organizations who have been working in Lebanon for a long time, even before independence. They always step up at any crisis as frontline uh, responders, service providers, community leaders and advocates, and as resilience builders. The Lebanon Family Planning Association for Development and Empowerment has been working in Lebanon since uh, 1969, 51 years. It is the first and oldest family planning association working to expand the uh, access to reproductive sexual health services and implementing uh, programs and projects to empower women and youth and really achieve uh, gender equality. Uh, my time is up, but I want to say that uh, we are also in, uh, we are in first line uh, to respond to any crisis and, uh, and I hope to tell you about LFKD on sometime uh, later on a greater depth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cecilia, and we'll definitely have opportunities during the Q&A section to delve deeper into the work of yours and the other organizations represented here today. Thanks for those remarks. We're now going to turn to Olfat Mahmoud, who is the founder of the Palestinian Women's Humanitarian Organization. Olfat will share how the compounded crises in Lebanon have affected Palestinian refugees specifically, and how feminist civil society organizations like her own are on the front lines of responding. Olfat, the floor is yours. As well, Woman Deliver, for giving me this opportunity to meet all of you. Uh, we have always been here. When I uh, received the invitation, I love the slogan. Um, because as Palestinian refugees, we want to say we have always been here since 1948. And we want the world to recognize us as a human beings. Uh, we need to be treated with dignity and humanity. Uh, 72 years uh, of suffering and lying under compounded crisis all the time, not just only because of Corona. So we are expert in this problem. Uh, Palestinian refugees are living in, in the refugee camps in Lebanon. And I won't tell you about the conditions there, very bad. It's like uh, uh, overcrowded and uh, the infrastructure is very, very poor. Um, we are deprived from most of our basic rights and mainly the right to return to our homeland, for example. So that means we will stay refugees, it seems forever. And secondly, it's the right to work and other rights, of course, but these are basic. So if we are not allowed to work, how we can survive? Most Palestinians are working within Palestinian workforce, which is very little opportunity for them. So most of the people work on daily payment work. And the medical uh, services and educational services as well as refugees. In each camp, we have only one clinic to see the patients. In half a day, they see more than 100 patients a day. So you can, you can tell how are the services. Um, of course, my colleagues, they talked about the Lebanese situation and what's happened. I will talk about the effect of that on the refugees. For example, on the 17th of October uh, revolution, which started on the 17th, most Palestinians who work on daily payment jobs, they couldn't go to work. So that means no income to the family. Then we have the economic crisis in Lebanon. And most Palestinians, they are very dependent on money comes from abroad from their relatives. So if they send them money through the bank, the value is really lost. So it's very difficult. 
uh, then we have another problem, the, the COVID-19 virus, which means many, many, many people couldn't go to work. So if they don't work, they can't get any salary. Uh, it's not easy to talk with people about uh, physical distancing, about preventive procedures. It's overcrowded. People are living really in a, like, for example, Burj Al Barajni camp where I work, it's one square and more than 40,000 people live there. So you can imagine how crowded it is. Big families, like seven members, uh, eight members, they live in two rooms or one room with one small kitchen, one toilet. How we can talk about preventive procedures. Uh, people, were, people still are frightened to death because of COVID-19. And if one get it in the camp, everyone will get it. And now we have big problem. What's happening? Uh, it's the camp. Uh, also, the the Beirut uh, explosion. It affects people because they were frightened, and because they told me I don't have more time. But as an NGO, we did not really stop and just nag. We have to do something. So we are providing educational services and we are providing health uh, services to the people. But I'll tell you, children, they don't have enough funds. So what happens, like even if we teach online through internet, most children, they don't get the opportunity to learn. And we are very worried about that. So we need you to keep to have refugees, remember them, and they exist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I have to hurry. Well, Fat, there's too much to say. There are too many challenges that you're working hard to respond to. Thank you so much for your really powerful words. Um, next up, we're going to switch to our colleague Rola Akrobi, who is the country manager for Women Now for Development. She's going to speak about the specific needs of Syrian refugee girls and women who are living in Lebanon during these compounded crises and her advocacy asks of international donors to better support feminist civil society. Rola, the floor is to you. Hello, thank you, Marcy. Uh, 10 سنوات مرت على معاناة السوريين وسوريا. 10 سنوات من القصف والدمار والاعتقال التعسفي والهجرة القصرية ومن ثم العيش في شروط لا ترقى لتحقيق الحد الأدنى للشرط الإنسان. اليوم وبشكل مفاجئ. وبدون أي استعداد محلي أو دولي ظهرت أزمة كوفيد-19 ليصبح هذا الواقع أشد تعقيدا وصعوبة أجرت منظمة النساء الآن من أجل التنمية دراسة لتحديد الآثار غير المتناسبة للجائحة على النساء والفتويات في منطقة البقاع الأوسط تمحوت الدراسة حول ثلاث آثار للجائحة على النساء تحديدا أولها الأثر الاقتصادي وفقدان كثير من العائلات لمصدر رزقها ثم الأثر النفسي والتزايد العنف القائم على النوع الاجتماعي والأثر الاجتماعي استجابة منظمة النجاء النساء الآن من أجل التنمية تركزت وآمنت بأن الحياة اليومية المعاشة هي الأكثر كشفا عن التمييز واللا عدالة التي تواجهها النساء والفتيات في سياق حياتهن اليومية ونؤمن بهذه المقاربة أكثر من التعريف المعتمدة في القوانين والتشريعات الدولية والمحلية فالعدالة بالنسبة للنساء هي العدالة الاقتصادية بشكل يضمن حصولهن على وسائل العيش الأولية والتعليم لأطفالهن وحمايتهن من كافة أشكال العنف المحتملة جاء تفسير أربع آب ليفاقم الأمور سوءا وظهرت النتائج على المجتمع المحلي المهمش ومجتمع اللاجئين اللاجئين السوريين مثلهم مثل الفئات الأفقر في المجتمع غير مرئيين بظل غياب دور الحكومة اللبنانية بتوفير الشروط الإنسانية اللائقة يبرز دور المجتمع المدني المحلي في تنظيم ومسامنة مجتمع اللجوء لكن كيف يهدم المانحون بصورة غير مقصودة عمل منظمات غير حكومية التي يحتاجها اللبنانيون بشدة كما اللاجئون فإعادة توجيه الجزء الأكبر من الدعم نحو المساعدات الطارئة وتركيزها على العمل ضمن منطقة جغرافية محصورة بيروت مثلا قد يدفع 
العمل المجموعات المحلية إلى تغيير أهدافها واستبدالها بمهام العمل الإنساني الطارئ مما يترك فراغا كبيرا في العمل التنموي وتمكين النساء والمشاركة السياسية لهن هذا مع الأخذ بعين الاعتبار بأن الحل المستدام لأزمة جوجو وهو العودة الآمنة والطوعية والكريمة ما زال بعيد التحقق بظل الأوضاع السياسية والأمنية التي تسيطر على البلاد التوصيات من المهم توفير تمويل مرن وطويل الأمد يشمل دعم الكلفة الأساسية لمنظمة كوركونتيان وقبول مبدأ نو كوست اكستنشن اثنين تخصيص جزء من التمويل الممنوح للبنان المضيفة للاجئين لدعم منظمات المجتمع المدني المحلية مباشرة بدون وساطة الحكومة اللبنانية أو المنظمات الدولية المساهمة بالضغط على النظم النظام المالي الدولي لكي تسمح البنوك بتحويل المال اللازم للمنظمات داخل لبنان إشراك المجتمع المدني بآلية رقابة على كيفية توزيع الأموال الممنوحة لدعم المجتمع اللبناني واللاجئين المساهمة بالضغط على الحكومة اللبنانية للحد من القيود والملاحقات التي يفرضها على منظمات المجتمع المدني نهاية فإن الأزمة السورية هي واحدة من أعنف الأزمات في القرن الواحد والعشرين وما يعانيه السوريون والسوريات داخل الأرض السورية أو بلدان اللجوء من أعنف ومن أعنف الأزمات التي مرت بها القوى الأرضي الكرة الأرضية أملنا كبير بالدعم الذي نتلقاه من المانحين ومنظمات المجتمع الدولي والدولية والمحلية لمساعدتنا على التخفيف من الأثر الهمجي للأزمة والمضي قدما في طريق بناء دولة المواطنة المتساوية وشكرا. Thank you so much, Rola. That was really powerful. Our last speaker in this Lebanon section will be Hayat Murshad, who is the head of communications and campaigning at the Lebanon um, the Lebanese Women Democratic Gathering, or RDFL. Um, she's going to wrap up our Lebanon case study by sharing how compounded crises uh, in Lebanon have affected gender-based violence and early marriage in particular, um, as well as her call to actions to respond to this. Uh, Hyatt, before you begin, I just want to note that Hyatt recently published a very powerful op-ed on this topic in The Guardian. If you haven't seen it yet, I really recommend that you take a look at it after her work today. Hyatt, over to you. Thanks a lot, Marcy. I will enter directly into the challenging situation uh, that women, girls, and other marginalized uh, groups are facing as a result of the a uh, recent situation that my colleagues already covered and tackled. Uh, already high levels of violence against the marginalized in Lebanon are becoming compounded by quarantines, social isolation, security threats, and job income losses, which, uh, uh, which intensifies the individual, family, and societal stresses. These factors are challenging the ability of women and girls uh, and the marginalized to escape abusive partners, access emergency and self-saving services, and increase their risk to violence. According to official data, the percentage of domestic violence against women and girls increased by 100%, and the percentage of online gender-based violence by 180% only at the first uh, or early months of the lockdown in Lebanon. The GBV IMS report also indicated uh, several forms of GBV women and girls during the first quarter of 2020 were facing compared to the same period, the months in 2019. An assessment conducted by the interagency FGBV task force in Lebanon have shown also that among the most prevalent types of violence observed were physical violence, 55%, sexual violence, 32%, and also child marriage, 4%. And here, speaking about child marriage, I want to say that in addition to gender inequality, there are three main drivers present in most instances of early child and forced marriages, which are economic insecurity, safety concerns, and lack of educational opportunities. Unfortunately, all these drivers are, uh, and more, are currently uh, dominating in our country where despite the absence of official data on this topic, our social workers present on ground all over Lebanon are highly alerting uh, the increased risk of marriage a number of girls are facing. 
Also, a recent IRC survey revealed that the second most common form of gender-based violence in the country was the forced and early marriage of girls. In addition, in a recent analysis by Save the Children, uh, it showed that over half a million children in Greater Beirut were already struggling to survive or were even going hungry. This explosion will have only made their situation worse, where children are left at increased risk of child labor, which reduces their chances to return to school when they reopen. Data also from SAVE shows that child marriage is reportedly on the increase uh, uh, for girls among, mainly among Syrian refugee populations in Lebanon. In addition, one of the new pressing realities for women and girls living in Lebanon is period poverty, where estimations indicate that by December 2020, almost half of them will not be able to afford uh, sanitary pads and menstrual products. Uh, finally, I would like to emphasize that feminist activists and the grassroots feminist organizations, as my colleagues mentioned, were among the first to respond to every challenge and disaster impacting the most marginalized. Our vital role and the critical contributions to change as for revolution, as for humanitarian action were clear uh, before and after Beirut, uh, Beirut's port burst into flames at times of economic crisis, social security and political hardships and in response to COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, in every crisis, we are excluded uh, from humanitarian funding and decision making. Uh, to drive the most effective and inclusive and sustainable response possible, this needs to change. At least 50% of all humanitarian funding for local civil society organizations should be directed to feminist organizations, and these funds need to be flexible and accessible. Finally, despite health, economic death, and psychological threats, we feminists will remain where we've always been in our beloved Lebanon, uh, serving our people and community uh, during crisis and calm and continue our lifelong battle for a gender equal society. And finally, the burning question remains, will the international actors and partners stand with us among all this? Thank you, Marty. Wow, thank you, Hayat. I will stand with you. I would always stand with you, holy cow. Um, that was incredible. That was so powerful. Thank you so much to all of our presenters from Lebanon. Um, I don't know about you, but I was taking notes along the way and I noted a number of very clear advocacy asks um, that I want to just relay um, so that they stay with you as we move on in this agenda. The first, women-focused civil society organizations are providing life-saving services, including sexual and reproductive health care services in Lebanon, and they're working in areas where there are no national or international actors responding. So this is a crucial and absolutely necessary lifeline for crisis-affected girls and women. The second point um, that I noted is that marginalized communities, including refugees, have the smallest social safety nets and are deeply struggling in this enormously complex time in Lebanon. Um, it is, it's leading to impossible choices and families taking on negative coping mechanisms like forced early and child marriage. Last, I want to note that those who are, who are most deeply impacted by these crises must be at the forefront of humanitarian responses. We cannot support humanitarian programming if it fails to have inclusive design, inclusive planning, inclusive implementation, and inclusive evaluation with women-focused civil society organizations like the ones you just heard from. All right, we're gonna pause for a moment. I'm going to remind everyone that before we move on, this has brought up a lot of really fascinating points. If you have specific questions for any presenters, please do pose them in the chat or the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and this will help make sure that you don't forget important questions. We'll make sure that uh, as many as possible are asked uh, when we get to the Q&A section next. From here, we are going to move on to Bangladesh. I'm going to have the pleasure of turning the mic to Tanjila Muzemer uh, Drishti, who is the Senior Manager for BRAC and is also a Women Deliver Young Leader. Drishti is going to share the context in Bangladesh the compounded crises that that country is facing, and her particular calls to action. Drishti, over to you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, thank you for this opportunity for sharing the stage with all these extraordinary uh, feminist advocates. I would dive straight into uh, the situation of Bangladesh. Uh, a population of 170 million, 1,116 
people, 1,116 people per square kilometer. High population density, pre-existing poverty, extreme poverty, unemployment crisis, rising inequality, pretty much sums up most low and lower middle income countries in the world. Yet, Bangladesh was affected disproportionately during the pandemic. COVID hit Bangladesh during early March. The country had a doctor to patient ratio of 5.26 for every 10,000 people, while WHO's minimum recommendation is 23 per 10,000. There were only 500 ventilators and 1,169 ICU beds in the whole country. In light of COVID, the country's already fragile health system was stretched too thin. This resulted in both inadequate COVID-focused health services and disruption at all levels of essential health care. While on one hand, resource constraints were restricting overall COVID response, on the other hand, the lockdown resulted in loss of livelihood and starvation for millions across the country. Furthermore, adding on to the health and economic crisis, a cyclone named Amphan decided to cross over the coastal region of the country, affecting millions of people across 26 districts uh, with loss of home, income, and crops. The deadly storm had a financial implication of 1,100 crore BDT, uh, destroyed crops in over 176,000 hectares of land and left more than 10 million people without access to electricity for days. Further adding on to the pandemic, loss of livelihood and cyclone Amphan came the beautiful monsoon and the devastating flood. Quoting Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, one third of my country was underwater last month. The heaviest rains in almost a decade began and have still not abated. More than 1.5 million Bangladeshis are displaced. Tens of thousands of hectares of paddy fields have been washed away. Millions of my compatriots will need food aid this year. Even though we are not one of the biggest contributors to the climate change, but we are one of the worst hit victims. It is essential to point out at this point that Bangladesh is also hosting the world's largest refugee camp in Cox's Bazar district, providing shelter, support, and protection to millions of Rohingya refugees who fled ethnic and religious persecution in our neighboring country, Myanmar. Hence, under the current scenario, ensuring COVID prevention and services in the refugee camp only adds on to the pile of challenges and complexities. A pandemic, disruption in healthcare, economic backlash, loss of agricultural products, natural disaster, climate change, and refugee crisis. Bangladesh does not have a double or triple burden of problems, but is rather faced with what I would call a buffet of multidimensional and interconnected challenges, none of which can be solved without facilitating collective actions, ensuring inclusivity, and support from our global partners in change. When it comes to COVID response, Resource constraints have been quite an issue in Bangladesh's fight against the pandemic. Access to COVID testing for all still remains a struggle. Even among the ones who have access to tests, we clearly see that less women are getting tested than men. Perhaps something to think about. Moreover, due to socio-cultural barriers, women have less access to media and outside world. Hence are also at a risk of having less access and understanding about the preventive measures of COVID. Foreseeing this crisis point, BRAC, a Bangladesh-based NGO, also the largest NGO in the world, mobilized a workforce of 50,000 community health workers and volunteers who were all females. Bypassing the cultural barriers, this squad of superwomen went door to door to more than 35.5 million households in urban slums and rural villages, teaching both women and men about life-saving preventive information. There are also various alarming secondary impacts of the pandemic, especially on women and young females. Needs of girl children being neglected at the household level is a norm we all grew up getting used to. This includes their need for education, healthcare, and uh, nutritious food. In light of the pandemic, these needs have been further pushed out of the household priority list. As a result, according to leading social scientists during the pandemic, child marriage has increased significantly, putting girls at a deadly risk of underage pregnancy. Furthermore, due to loss of livelihood, many poor families with limited food are following an unequal distribution of food where girl children are getting smaller portions as they are not expected to go to work outside. Moreover, sanitary pads have been labeled as a luxury item and have been completely pushed out of the household essential list uh, for millions of adolescents um, towards uh, and pushed millions of adolescents towards unhygienic menstrual practice. Now, while BRAC at BRAC, we stood strong with the communities we serve, but most more need, there's a, there's a bigger need uh, that needs to be uh, addressed here. If essential healthcare and nutrition and family planning services are not uh, restored with proper protocols and full capacity immediately, then as a country, I'm afraid to say Bangladesh stands at the edge of a cliff where falling down 
would mean losing all the progress we have made over the past two decades. And this fall will come at a cost of lives. We say this is an era of youth leadership, and yet there are only very few young people on the decision-making tables. Among those who make it, there are rarely any women. I'm sure there are many women in the audience today who have been denied or deprived of leadership role based on two things. One, they are young. Two, they are fe female. As a result, voices and perspectives of young women uh, remain unheard and their problems remain unaddressed during compound crises. If things are to change, voices of female youth must be included in the decision-making process, essentially because the complexities of challenges young females face today are different from the ones young females faced a decade ago. Donors and global partners must push for including young women to be put in decision-making roles in order to ensure that organizations start to ensure inclusive response to the problems actually have inclusivity while designing, deciding, and implementing the solution. May empowered young women lead the path for change. Thank you. Wow, Drishti, thank you so much. That was incredibly powerful. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor to our final civil society speaker uh, in this section, Lippi Raman. She's the executive director for Badaban Sangho, um, and she is going to share some, uh, some of the issues that are affecting girls and women and the ways that feminist civil society organizations are responding on the ground. Lippi, you're up. Thank you, Marcy. And dear colleagues and friends, good evening and greetings from Bangladesh. Um, in the beginning of my career, I used to visit the region around the Bay of Bengal for field work, and I felt the urge inside myself to work for these communities that uh, less privileged women who are you know, depriving from their rights to see the sufferings and deprivation of women from their land ownership and how they are facing violence in their home and outside. The organization was formed with the passion and experiences I had during my journey as a change maker. Badawan Shangwa is a local women-led organization has started its journey in 2015 in the southern part uh, region uh, that is called Rampal uh, near Shundarbon, the largest mangrove, which is also next to the Bay, uh, I, I, as I mentioned, that next to the Bay of Bengal. We work with the issues of girls and women, especially land rights and land-induced violence against women and uh, climate change and its impact on girls and women, uh, fisher folk women and migrant workers' rights. And during our field work, we have experienced that women understanding of the value of the property, the documents of ownership and the income from the production of the uh, property is very low and vague because they don't have access and they uh, lack of access, they actually uh, came to know very, uh, they don't have the knowledge and uh, which brings inequality and injustice. On the other hand, women are facing the worst forms of violence regarding land disputes and become more vulnerable, which gives them silent to ask for their rights. They cannot fight for the lands as they have little knowledge and uh, on administrative documents and do not have any resources to fight for their cases. We also work with the um, uh, community that uh, widows, single women, uh, religious minorities and indigenous women who are actually suffering many uh, injustice and uh, deprived from their rights. And recently, Badawan Changwa is also working with the returning migrant workers who actually lost their job overseas for the COVID and are coming back to Bangladesh. And um, as we are working in the rural areas of Bangladesh, next to the, um, uh, and these areas are often, uh, you know, uh, affected by the cyclone, salinity, tidal surge, and climate change is a huge thing in this area. And uh, climate change affects all the people in the areas I know, but the most affected are girls and women because women are uh, managing the water, uh, water source. And we have seen that for salinity, girls and women have to be drinking water because there are scarcity of sweet water for drinking and they have to bring water from, for their families. Water from far away, which is health hazard. And at the same time, they face insecurity and often face violence by the perpetrators where, while bringing the water. The women fisher folk also cannot claim their rights, you know, as they are not considered professional fisher folk um, by the authority. And they are uh, actually do not get sometimes the security secured. Also women who catch fish and do long work in the saline water are having problems with different health issues and it usually affects their sexual and reproductive health. Now I'm going to talk about the situation at grassroots level where um, uh, early marriages and uh, you know, uh, happened uh, during this COVID uh, 
COVID-19 situation. Pressure on women for selling the land is being coming from the brokers, family members, and opportunities. Uh, because there are, uh, they have lost their jobs, they don't have any source of income, and uh, it was easier for, uh, for them to sort of, uh, force these women to sell the lands. And domestic violence is also increased uh, a lot due to less income, food intake is being reduced by women and girls at household level. We are already have already um, uh, Dristito, uh, speaking spoke about this. Young girls are unable to manage their uh, menstrual hygiene as they cannot buy sanitary napkins. And also, uh, women are unable to seek medicine for their antenatal and postnatal care as well as contraceptives. And we, I, I, I have already mentioned that during this pandemic, we have found several cases that women are often uh, forced to sell their uh, own lands as they do not have their incomes. And what Badabon are doing uh, is doing is that Badabon, Badabon Songho has a motivated team members who actually going to the fields and have quartered session and they actually help the, the women to develop their leadership skills so that they can speak out about their issues on their own uh, on different platforms. We are educating women on land documentation and its importance. We provide legal support and actually we provide the, we have a panel, a panel uh, lawyer who actually supporting all the time these uh, the, who are uh, survivors who are uh, actually suffering from this violence and, um, and uh, needs legal support. Badawan Chungo also work with different stakeholders on climate results to lessen the impact on women lives, provide training to stakeholders. Also, uh, during COVID-19, we collected information through mobile phones and we linked with the government and we provided uh, some support that those are not actually sufficient though. And, um, what I'm uh, going to say to the international uh, donor fund agencies and uh, as a uh, represent as a, on behalf of uh, uh, grassroots level women rights organization that women's organization are desperately underfunded. Long term core funding is essential to enable them to bring about social changes that uh, we have seen that uh, the funding donors plan for project based um, uh, project for two three years, which cannot sustain for long. And we are supporting women with legal aid and other supports that uh, are only two, three years, and then we stop. And the, uh, um, so I think that uh, funding is, when the funding ends, the support is also stopped. So I think the intervention should be designed for a long time, like a program based, then we could would be able to see the change what we want for girls and women to see. And local organizations need contingency funds so that in case of emergency, community members can get support. And on the other hand, often the reporting farmers uh, actually are not easy for the local staff to manage uh, instantly due to language and unfamiliar tools where a bottom-up approach can be introduced considering the local cultural context. And uh, that is from my part. And finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to Women Deliver to uh, giving me this uh, wonderful uh, opportunities to share my field experiences and what we need as a grassroots level women uh, organization. Thank you all. Thank you, Lippy. What a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks to Drishti too. This was a fantastic case study on Bangladesh. Um, just as before, I'm going to just name a couple of advocacy messages that I heard very clearly in these remarks. Um, so first, Drishti said, and I love, um, well, it's a strange thing to love, but I love the idea that there's a buffet of multidimensional and interconnected challenges. Probably not a buffet that anyone would like to eat at. Um, these are crises that cannot be solved without inclusive and collective action that centers on girls and women's priorities and values. Second, we heard again about girls and women having to make impossible choices that negatively impact them, uh, whether that's early child and forced marriage, hunger, a lack of basic access to sexual reproductive health care services, increased vulnerability to multiple forms of gender-based violence, and period poverty. And then finally, project funding that is accessible to women-focused civil society organizations right now is not sustainable or sufficient to meet the life-saving needs that they address in the communities where they work. Um, I have to say that I'm rather struck hearing both of these case studies back to back, noting that the contexts are incredibly different, but actually the needs of feminist civil society organizations seem quite aligned. So now from here, we're going to shift gears and we're going to hear a bit
from donors who are leaders in these communities and these contexts. They're going to have an opportunity now to share their reflections on the case studies and, um, uh, and the work that they're doing to drive more localized and feminist responses to humanitarian action. First up, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Valerie Bimo, who is the Deputy Director of Emergency Response at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to share your reflections on what we've heard so far. Valerie, over to you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, I feel even ashamed to have to speak after all the powerful story that we just heard from the, the woman. And I, I feel like this, there's no summary. I think you did a good summary of what is the, the, the crisis and what is going on. One of the things that is really powerful on what we, we heard, and but what we also know is that any crisis and what COVID did in the crisis now is to magnify the inequality. This is actually just reflected on all the different presentation is that COVID, as uh, Melinda said, is uh, gender blind, but it's not gender neutral. That means that it will affect everybody, but it's not affecting them the same way. And this is really important to, to, to understand. And one of the things, and I like the fact to say, we are just human beings. And I think as human beings, we need to be looking as women being, and we have to also look at women not just as victims, but as uh, actors. As, because the only way we'll make this situation better is when we're making sure that you give, you empower women, and we give them the power to, to the economic power that is needed. But with these leaders who are fighting to even get access, I think, um, Angela mentioned even access to media, to donors, to simple things, because it's also here you have an inequality. They may do the good job, and we know that no matter what, they are always there. We don't have to look for them. They are always there. They are always the first humanitarian. They'll be there. They look at it. And the importance to why it's important to give to, to women and to women organization, actual led organization, is that it's the, 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 the lens they bring to the, the crisis is a, is a lens that is a feminist lens. She will see the whole family. She will see the need across, and she will not just be blind in one way. And that is actually a powerful way of looking at this. But also, when we look at the, 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 the woman, they usually would like look at it as a holistic way. And that means that they were trying to look at the short and long term. And we heard that from a lot of the ladies, they said, yes, because the child early child marriage is not just a new thing. It's not just something that will be short term. It's, it's solving a short term with the food, but it's, it's solving a longer issues with reducing the woman and the girl to go to school. As the GET Foundation, as you know, we, uh, Melinda Gates, I've been really vocal about the power of women. I've been vocal about like, we need to do more and pushing all organizations, including us in the foundation to, to really think with that gender um, lens. And, and the more important is that we know that unless for humanitarian, we have been working really diligently to look at capacity strengthening and working with local and national organization because we believe that they will be the first, they will be there before, during and after. And they're usually the first responder. How do we actually start looking at them, not at just the beneficiary, and that is the only the problem is that we look at them as a beneficiary, instead of saying, no, they are the actors, they are the, 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 the provider, they are the one there. And I think that is really critical for us to to start really pushing and looking at that perspective of local organization. And the more important and more and more I think about it is that we know that COVID really, again, I said, magnifying the inequality and the same way the response to COVID have to magnify the issues and the needs. And it's an important 
piece to, to look at how do we look at essential services, but more important, how do we make sure that the economic power, and I will just list something that, uh, to close, the, something that Melinda said in one of the tweets, he said, there's only one solution for all this crisis, and that is making sure we give women economic power. And that is the essential. And with the power we saw here, we all the lady, this making us feel like we are not doing enough and there's so much more we can do. And that is for me the message. The women are not the victim. They are the actor and they are the key to our success. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Valerie. I really appreciate your remarks. We're now going to shift to our other donor responder, Navid Chowdhury. He is the uh, Senior Policy Advisor on the Civil Society team at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. So Navid, the floor is now yours. Th thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'd like to uh, first thank you and uh, Women Deliver uh, for giving this opportunity and for other colleagues. Um, many thanks to colleagues from Bangladesh and Lebanon for their very moving presentation on how women are leading the response in humanitarian emergencies, which we have just heard. It clearly demonstrated how women-focused and women-led organizations um, uh, can play a critical role in ensuring girls and women's voices and issues uh, which are amply, uh, which are multiplied in emergency, humanitarian emergencies. These, as we know, these emergencies are increasingly complex, um, founded, as we know, not only on one single issue or conflict or natural disaster, as we have seen in both Lebanon and Bangladesh, um, but uh, these are uh, exacerbated by compilation of multiple compounded crises. I have, um, just to uh, say that I have personal connection to both of these countries, having been uh, born in Bangladesh, raised there, uh, my village where my parents were born has been, was flooded, is regularly flooded. It's, it's almost actually gone in the south of the country. We can't go and live there anymore. Um, so uh, that's my connection. And I lived in Lebanon for almost three years and my flat in Hamra has just been devastated um, in the recent, uh, explosion. Um, it, it, I left Lebanon about um, two years ago, so my flat, which I used to live, is not, not there anymore. So I can totally relate, I think, at a, from a personal level, about the, the role that um, a, or people, and especially women, play in humanitarian emergencies, because I think in both the cases, as we've seen in Bangladesh and Lebanon, women suffered the most, and women had the most to lose. Um, but we have, what we have also heard from this presentation is that Southern uh, women focused and women rights organization are among the first responders on the front line. And they are the one who can reach the vulnerable women and girls first. So while the uh, women get the, the, the suffer the most, but they, the organizations that work with them have the ability to reach the most marginalized and most excluded, which are frequently women and girls uh, in the most minimal amount of time. Uh, so it also teaches us that responses in which women are not consulted or included in decision making could be simply less effective and in most, in many cases, can even be harmful. So the UK strongly advocates for women to be able to meaningfully participate in humanitarian coordination and decision making in both emergency response and, emergent and long term recovery phase. We have been regularly consulting various women's funds and women's rights organization, women-led and focused civil society organization to understand firsthand what's happening and, um, and to inform our response to make them more gender responsive. And through, this engage and through our engagement with UN, the World Bank, G7, the UK promotes the importance of recognizing women as frontline actors and leaders and, and works and works with women-led organizations to be an integral part of international humanitarian response system. To shift greater leadership and decision-making to women-focused civil society organizations, we are um, in the process of strengthening our current approach, which builds on pre-existing uh, local and national capacity. And these include 
tracking our fund tracking so that our funding is going to a more diverse set of responders at the local and national level, many of which, as we know, are women focused civil society organization. Promoting more equitable partnership between FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, in which, uh, with which DFID has merged recently, uh, and civil society organizations. Strengthening local capacity through a targeted capacity strengthening of partners, and strengthening communication with communities and empowering local civil society organizations, those specially led by marginal groups and those led by women and girls, ethnic minorities, disabled people, and older people to work more with these groups. Currently, we have several mechanisms through which we fund women-focused civil society. For example, our support to UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women, which provides support and um, uh, issues grants to women, the women's rights organization and other small grassroots organization. Uh, and we are also supporting Amplify Change, a program to fund grassroots organization to address um, sexual reproductive health, FGM, and child and forced marriage. So I will stop here. Um, of course, we'll have more chance to uh, talk later uh, during question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Navid. That was really a helpful overview. Thanks for sharing that. Um, it is now time for our question and answer section. Um, it is absolutely not too late to share your questions in the chat section or in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, or you can raise your hand. Uh, all valid ways to pose a question. I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague Rita, who's been monitoring the chat and is going to read some of the questions aloud to our speakers to respond. Rita, over to you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, and we have a question that was emailed to us actually by Shamin Yonjo. Uh, her question is, how have feminist CSOs responded to mental health uh, issues, including among uh, their members and staff, uh, as mental health has not always been given a priority and has been on a rise in the pandemic pandemic period. Um, I can answer that question, Rita, if you want. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, actually, over the last year, we have been, um, I work for Melsa Sexual Health Center in Beirut. And over the last year, we have been uh, receiving uh, an increased request for mental health support. We already have it as a service at the organization. And uh, since COVID, we have also developed uh, online consultations. Uh, for our uh, beneficiaries, they range between women and uh, LGBTIQ individuals. And as for the staff members, we have also uh, noted that our mental health has been uh, affected, especially since the Beirut blast, as our offices and homes were uh, affected by the explosion. Um, we were very aware of its effect on our uh, well-being and we had an internal discussion. We also had a group session that was uh, optional for the, our team members. Uh, we had it with our psychotherapist and uh, we also, uh, many of us seek individual sessions and uh, we have been uh, contributing to the coverage of these uh, sessions with our staff members. Anyone else want to come in to respond to this question? Uh, Marcy, I would like to take hey, a dive with an not, an not, an necessarily, not necessarily not necessarily an answer to this. Uh, uh, Sorry, it sounds like Rola, go ahead. Oh, okay. Roll the first and then we'll have Drishti follow. Sorry. Hey. In the terms of the mental health issues, there is a lot of pressure on the 
وتجلت مو بس بالشكل النفسي صارت تحولت لظاهره فيزيائيه يعني صاروا نقص اكل عدم نوم فعلا في كثير مشاكل صارت بس بنفس الوقت كنا نلاحظ انه ما عاد في تبليغ عن اي مشكله من مشاكل العنف صاروا النساء بيخافوا لانه محاصرات بمنازلهم وممنوعات يطلعوا فحتى تليفوناتهم انسحبت منهم لانه صاروا يقولوا لهم ازواجهم والذكور بالعائله انه بما انه وقف شغلكم ليش بدكم الاتصال مع العالم الخارجي؟ فتحاصروا النساء وصار في مشكله حقيقيه، هلا نحن حالات قسم الدعم النفسي عندنا الجماعي ضل مستمر اونلاين بس كل شيء الدعم النفسي ون باي ون كيس مانجمنت ما يقبلوا اونلاين بدهم يشوفوا الناس فنحن صعب كنا نروح على المخيمات فهذا توقف وصرنا نحاول نعود بهيك لقاءات شخصيه مثلا نفتح المركز لشخص واحد مشان نقدر نقدم الدعم النفسي للنساء اللي بحاجه له فعلا لانه كثير كانوا بحاجه له بس هي ملاحظتي شكرا Trishti, would you like to go? Sure, Marcy. Thank you. Am I audible? Okay. Uh, so I did not necessarily want to talk about how CSOs on the ground or feminist-focused CSOs on the ground are addressing mental health, but I actually wanted to put it out there that, you know, like our speakers already mentioned, that there are online uh, systems through which mental health problems are being tackled, but for countries like Bangladesh and other neighboring countries, which are lower and lower middle income countries, online methods will not necessarily work for a vast majority of the population. So there is a strong interest from CSOs on ground where we want to respond to mental health at scale. And it is essentially, like right now it's, ne it's a necessity, especially in light of the pandemic. But when we look at, because we have like two really prominent donor representatives, on the panel here today. I would like to take this opportunity to put it out there that when we look at the international aid or funding landscape for mental health, we don't see as much of an interest or a support, particularly in this issue for offline methods in lower and lower middle income countries. So uh, if any of the donor representatives would want to take a, a stab at that and respond as to you know, what are the plans for their particular organizations when it comes to mental health at a grassroots level. Thank you so much. I don't want to put anyone on the spot necessarily, but uh, it, do, it, do Valerie or, uh, or Navid want to respond right now uh, on that mental health question? Um, if not, we can move on to the next question and give you an opportunity to come in later. Yeah. So um, I just want to come very quickly on the mental health question. I think. Um, uh, Drishti is right. It is uh, somewhat different. So when I was in Jordan, we uh, we worked. We I was aware of, and we actually supported some um, helpline uh, uh, supporting women um, for, suffering from mental health, and it was quite um, quite challenging for quite a few reasons. First of all, um, many of these helplines were actually manned, uh, were actually managed by men. So women didn't feel that they, uh, they were comfortable in calling and sharing their very, of course, uh, very sensitive information. Um, secondly, also there was this whole issue about providing services which were being demanded. If the service provision is not there, just by calling and asking for the services, mental health won't work. So, um, but what we also found that this is an issue which is absolutely needs to be um, uh, addressed, um, in, especially in emergency situation, especially in terms of humanitarian response um, uh, and recovery. I think this is very crucial because just after a humanitarian thing happens, it, it impacts on mental health of women and girls uh, a lot, everybody, but it, even they're more precarious. So. I think, uh, but the systems, the, first you need to build the systems in a way which is inclusive and which caters to the needs in a very practical way uh, in order for it to be successful. Thanks. Thanks for that. Rita, why don't we go ahead with the next question now? Um, okay. 
Sure. So a question from Scott Velasco from Action Against Hunger. Uh, their question is, I was wondering how we can change the perception of the women in these areas. Many consider that it is a view from the West. What can we do locally with that issue? I, uh, can I answer, Marcy? Well, I think that, uh, that the key point uh, speaking about uh, changing the acceptance of women or the mentality of women towards any intervention uh, done either by national or international organizations uh, is to ensure that these interventions are really addressing women's needs because unfortunately at the majority of times uh, usually we receive set agendas from the INGOs and from the donors uh, without even being uh, aware of the current context and the current needs of women and girls. And also, unfortunately, at many times, uh, they don't even listen to the priorities. I can give an example. Uh, now, recently, uh, after the Beirut blast, uh, you were speaking about mental health, which is a very important uh, issue, and I think that all Lebanese are traumatized and need mental health services uh, after all what's going on. Uh, but also there are other needs uh, on ground, like for example, the needs for uh, cash assistance, the needs for direct uh, support for people to uh, uh, renovate their houses, etc. There is a need to focus more on SRHR services and other, uh, other issues. Uh, we've been calling on donors in order to prioritize these issues, but unfortunately the agendas are set the same way uh, without even listening to the, to the needs of women on ground. So I think the key here is to make sure that every intervention uh, or support is really directed towards uh, the real needs of women on ground. Thank you, Hayat. Does anyone else want to? Oh, please go ahead, Roma. Can I? The truth is, I was in Syria. 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 I was in أنا ما بقدر طالب امرأة ما عندها مي ما عندها تأكل ما عندها تبعت ولادة على المدرسة ما عندها أي تأمين صحي إنه تفضى تفكر بمشاركتها السياسية أو الدفاع عن الحقوق بدي أبدأ من البيزك الأساسي لهدول النساء فعلا هن بيرفضوا أصلا يسمعونا كعلمانيات نسويات إذا ما تغيرت مقاربتنا للأولويات بحياتهم فلذلك كثير مهم نسمع المجتمع المحلي شو هي حاجاته وإحياجاته الأساسية ونكيف يعني مقولة ونكيف أفكارنا بناء عليها مقولة أنه النسوية هي عابرة للحدود وال 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 والقوميات والجنسيات ما تنطبق حقيقة أنا هلأ بعد شغلي على الأرض مع الجراس روت على الوضع الموجود بلبنان أو بأي منطقة محرومة في تغييرات لازم تتناسب مع الوضع الوضع الجراس روت شكرا Thank you I think we'll move on to the next question Rita Sure, sorry, question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I wanted to add because Rilla raised a very important point. I wanted to add to this that uh, uh, let's also try not to deny that uh, also the feminists in our region are, they have their own realities and they have uh, their own experiences and version of the story. So uh, also we have a, a kind of an heritage from other uh, feminists who already uh, built a more, uh, you know, uh, uh, a kind of feminism that is related to the context and needs in our in our region. 
Absolutely. Marcy, if I might just also quickly chip in. Uh, so basically when we say that, you know, uh, this uh, idea of feminism or this idea of women empowerment is coming from the West or anything, I believe that was the question. I did not really catch most of it, but I think that is where it is important that, you know, you make the solutions localized. So the model that BRAC follows right now is that we empower locally recruited women from within the communities. We train them to make sure that they become an agent of change within their community. So it's like, you know, if I would go and tell, let's say somebody in a rural village that this are, these are the things that you need to do in order to be empowered, they are less likely to take it seriously or less likely to buy in versus if their aunt next door or sister next door goes and tells that to them, then it doesn't necessarily become like, you know, a fancy um, development process that has been imported perhaps from some other part of the world. It is something that your neighbor is asking you to do for collective good. And I think in order to truly change cultures and you know, shift behaviors, it is essential that we make the solutions local and we empower local women to become the agent of change in order to deliver those solutions. Thank you so much, Drishti. Okay, thank you. Lippy, would you like to go? Yeah, yeah, I, I was just writing here. And the, yes, uh, as this is said that when actually um, we are uh, planning any project or, you know, in, in intervention that we actually include the women to, uh, before planning, we ask them to invite them that and go to them then to what their needs. And when we discuss with the donors or the local government or our government officials, we include them in this uh, discussion and in the panel also, because um, when they are used to this and the, and they, as they have the traditional, you know, views and they actually don't know these uh, project designs, but when we discuss again and again, we go to them and include them, that time their you know, perception and views already change can change, yeah. We have, uh, you know, proven this instance, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lippi. And I think we have time for one last question. And this one is for our, our donors on the call. Um, and, and the question is, what is uh, your position or your, your uh, government or agency's position regarding working with smaller feminist organizations? So those that are still informal groups uh, or are perhaps not as, as well known as some of the, the national and international organizations. Um, I can start to, to, the, to respond. Um, that is a big challenge, and I have to, to admit that this is difficult because um, as a donors, we have also regulation, tax regulation. We, there's some of the way we, we cannot make some grants. As I mentioned earlier, the problem with a lot of the small organizations is that they don't even have access, we, we can't even access them. What we have been doing or also advising for small organization is that most, if there is, you have a small organization alone, they will be difficult for them to thrive and sometimes being together and combine themselves to, to, to give them more power. That's the first thing is like, is it possible to be um, organized in a way that you can combine multiple small, but themselves, and create a consortium or network or organization because it gives them already more power and then looking at that. The second things that we have been really looking at is almost forcing the one we can access to ask them the question now, which organization locally, because since we cannot give directly, that is a, just a challenge of making grant. Um, of course, I'm here in Seattle, I will not really know which one. I think somebody said we don't even know where they are, if they are informal, I cannot give them money, I, I, I cannot even know where they are, then usually, now what we're doing is that in the grant to organization, we ask them that question, we force them to say, look, if you're on the grant, which organization are you working with? Are they local organization? What, how do they, how do you work? And we almost forcing them to, to, to list them, to talk about them, because that's the first thing, because, Two, four or five years ago, they were not even mentioning their name. 
or in the report, then it's like we force them and say, if you are working with local, can you list them? Can you talk about them? Can you say what they have been doing? Can you at least make them visible, even in your reports? And then we also try to make sure that they actually have active subgrants to them, so that, but not just subgrant to as a contracting, but also say, are you giving them capacity for their own organization? Are you giving them a direct cost so that they can actually have basic operation costs? This is some of the thing, but it's getting, it's difficult. And I think, um, and I like the organization like BRAG, we are, BRAG is one of our partner. When we want to work in Bangladesh, we'll go to BRAG to say, look, you are there with the roots, in the grassroots, we cannot get there. Then we count in on you to make sure that you reach them and we'll be looking at you and be you'll be accountable to make sure that these women are there. And that is where we, we try to start, but it's still a big challenge and we still, actually maybe I will turn it to the ladies, like how do we do that? How do we reach out to you knowing that we have the constraints being far, um, being limited by the procedure and the tax issues? How do we reach out to you and what is the solution? Thank you. I think actually what Valerie has just offered is the beginning of a whole nother webinar, actually, which I would love to host and I would love to moderate. And I think that we should, after this finishes up, we should organize that because this is the kind of conversation that is really so desperately needed. Because what we're talking about is truly changing the way that the humanitarian system runs um, to be able to be more effective for girls and women. Um, which just means simply we have to change the game. We have to change the rules in the system. So I'm here for that. I would love to be a part of that, that, that second conversation. Um, Women Deliver would be honored to host. I think at this point, I'm looking at the clock. We need to move on to um, our final wrapping up remarks and our closing keynote speaker. So um, thank you first, before we turn it over to Sarah, a couple, a couple of quick notes from me. Um, first, I just have to thank every single one of these very powerful speakers today and our extremely talented interpreters who are making it possible for so many people to tune in and be a part of this dialogue. I'm so grateful. And of course, you know, thank you to all of you. I know just in the speakers alone, there are people who are joining before the sun is up and others are joining after the sun has gone down. This really takes everyone standing together around the world to make this happen. So I'm just deeply indebted to all of you and your dedication to this important topic. It gives me a lot of hope and a lot of faith for, for the direction of our community. I also very importantly need to thank the government of Canada who supports Women Delivers humanitarian advocacy work. What we'd heard today from feminist civil society speakers is that they have always been there. These organizations are frontline responders in every humanitarian response. They are service providers, they are community leaders, they are unwavering advocates, skilled peace builders, and sustainable drivers of progress. Despite their significant documented contributions to crisis responses, women-focused civil society organizations like the ones you heard from today consistently lack access to the funding and support that they need to meet the urgent needs they are addressing. To make sure that the findings from this conversation and uh, our, our research on this important topic reaches more than just the few hundred people who engaged in this conversation today, Women Deliver is going to be producing a report on this topic that will be released um, by the end of the year. Um, that document will make sure that all of the important contributions from all of the speakers today are written and shared with policymakers all around the world. And to deepen our research on this, we're going to be reaching out to everyone who engaged in this webinar today um, to participate in a data gathering um, exercise through uh, possibly an online survey. So please do um, look forward to hearing from us further to continue this important conversation and begin the process of making real change for these incredible change makers on the ground. So with that, I'm going to close our session today by passing the parole over to Sarah Noble. She's the Director of External Relations at The New Humanitarian, and she will share her reflections on everything we heard today. Sarah, over, oops, sorry. Sarah, over to you. Great, hi, thank you. Um, it's such an honor and a, and a privilege to speak with such an esteemed group of, uh, of women and men, and men today. Um, and thank you so much for Women Deliver for hosting this conversation. I work for The New Humanitarian, um, which is a nonprofit newsroom that reports from the heart of humanitarian crises. We aren't an advocacy organization, but uh, we see the role of uh, the media to inform, educate, and hold power to, to account. Um, and by choosing which stories to tell, whose experiences to share, and whose voices to amplify, 
the media really plays a role in helping to shape the world around us. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, access to, to media and whose voices are, are being shared within the media. Um, and we know, unfortunately, that most uh, mainstream media coverage of humanitarian crisis is quite selective on whose voice is highlighted. Uh, international organizations and NGOs are frequently uh, quoted in reports on conflict, for example, while local citizens are not. Um, and gender, unfortunately, is treated in a very narrow way within mainstream uh, humanitarian reporting, with very few articles looking at the specific problems uh, faced by women and girls. Uh, at the New Humanitarian, we try to do things differently, uh, and women and girls form a, a core focus of our reporting. Uh, at last year's Oslo Conference on Ending Sexual and Gender-Based Violence and Humanitarian Crises, we made a public pledge and committed to offering in-depth reporting and analysis that highlights the way that the international community can be more responsive to the unique needs of women and girls. Um, and we also committed to amplifying the voices of women, not only as victims, um, but as agents of change, which is something that came through the conversation today. Um, also avoiding sensational reporting that robs women and girls of their dignity and also documenting sexual abuse and gender-based violence in conflict areas and other crisis zones. Women and girls need platforms like ours through which they can tell their own stories. Uh, I'm very proud of a, a series that we launched this year called She Said, uh, which offers glimmers, glimpses into the excuse me, lives of women from emergencies around the world. Um, and recent coverage includes how the COVID-19 lockdowns and restrictions have led to increases in gender-based violence for displaced women in South Sudan, for Venezuelan women in Colombia, for Syrian women in Jordan and Lebanon, as we've heard today, for women in Kashmir, and the list, the, the list goes on. Um, and yesterday, on the eve of this last day of the UN General Assembly, um, our joint investigation with the Thomson Reuters Foundation uncovered claims by more than 50 women that they were sexually abused and exploited by aid workers and relief staff from the United Nations and some of the world's largest NGOs during the recent Ebola outbreak um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, and many of the women who spoke to reporters during the more than year long investigation said that they had been lured into sex for job schemes um, and some were Ebola survivors. Uh, and not one woman said that she knew of a hotline, an email address or a person to contact to report the incident. Um, critics say that this has highlighted the failure of programs to protect against sexual exploitation and abuse in humanitarian operations, which were underfunded and afterthought and male dominated with a few women in decision making roles. So as a newsroom covering humanitarian crises, these are the kind of issues that we come across time and time again in our reporting that highlight the need to include women and girls at every level and to amplify their voices on different platforms. Um, and for our part, we're going to continue to make good on our pledge to amplify your voices and the voices of women and girls through our journalism. And we uh, invite you to explore these issues in our She Said series um, and keep the conversation going with us at The New Humanitarian. And um, thank you for having me and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing on the ground. Thank you, Sarah. And with that, that's the end of our session. So thank you so much for exactly at time. It's been such a pleasure having you all with us today. Thanks. Take care.